ho, 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 Merry, it's Advent Trip. It's not Merry Christmas. And St. Nick, we're going to talk about St. Nick in this episode. This is a Homebrew Christianity podcast. My name's Trip. In this episode, we're talking to my friend, Dr. Adam English. And this is like a, a barrel-aged homebrewed Christianity episode. And it's not your normal barrel-aged episode. That's what we call old episodes we bring back because they aren't available on iTunes anymore. This is a, a barrel blending. Two different times I interviewed Adam English. He is a professor at Campbell University in Bowie's Creek, North Kakalak. He's written multiple books on St. Nick, the historical St. Nick, St. Nick and culture, all that kind of stuff. And I interviewed him about the different books. And every time I interview him, we also get on other topics. So this is a compilation, an edited down of two different interviews of all the St. Nick stuff. Because it's Advent. And St. Nick is one way to subvert Christmas, stealing all of Advent's time. St. Nick, he's more hardcore than Santa Claus. And I also, I didn't ask Adam this, but I have a high, I don't think St. Nick ever drank Coca-Cola. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You got it there. So, Adam English, he's written multiple books on St. Nick. We'll link to all of them in the post. And these are two different episodes where we talk about a bunch of stuff. And this is all the St. Nick things. Because I had people say, I can't find the St. Nick episodes. I really liked them. And then I found out. It's been hundreds of episodes since they came out. And I'm just trying to help to help you, podcast listeners, out. With high quality material to use in your sermons or talking to your friends or maybe you're just quiz bowling it up and St. Nick questions come up and you're like, I got this. It's right. Also, you know, before we jump in the episode, I want to tell a number of people thank you. Like Andy, Sharice, and Maddie. Those are three new members to the Homebrewed Christianity community. Mm-hmm. They went to homebrewedcommunity.com. They signed up. They donate every month. They make the podcast possible. And they're awesome. So shout, 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 out, out, out. You can do it too. You can go there, homebrewedcommunity.com, and become a member. Join the secret Facebook site. Be a part of all sorts of online goodness. And uh, also, you'll be in the list of people who get the first shot at getting tickets to the Homebrewed Christianity birthday party. Yeah, in 2018. It's going to blow your mind. It is. It is. Uh, If you live around the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area on the 16th of December. You should come out to the live podcast. Diana Butler Bass is going to be there. Friends from Crackers and Grape Juice. That evening, I'm preaching at Aldersgate United Methodist, and then we're doing the podcast, and then we're going to hang out and have craft beverages and such. So come on out. Also, 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 thank you for listening. I just wanted to tell you that. I appreciate it. Thank you for all of you that have emailed me or left, like, reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or uh, Google Play. Um, all that. I appreciate it. I really like the ones that tweet. And here, here's the thing. I have a Twitter list of all the homebrew deacons that I know are on Twitter. So if you're on Twitter and you aren't on the homebrew deacon list, then holler at me, at Trip Fuller. Say, can you put me on the homebrew deacon Twitter list? And then you follow that list, and you can go talk to other people, listen to the podcast, they're theology nerds. And if you're just one of those people that don't tweet, but you want to know what theology nerds do when they aren't just theologizing, then check out that Twitter list. It's great. Twitter's my favorite social media thing. And I know, it's hard to keep it as my favorite these days. But I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a... I seized it early, and I'm just persevering like the saints. Oh, yeah. I am. In the new year, we're going to be announcing Theology Beer Camps for 2018. We're going to announce the info about the birthday party. Uh, There are new books in the Homebrewed series about to come out. The Homebrewed Christianity Guide to Being Human by Donna Bowman. And the Homebrewed Christianity Guide to the Spirit by Grace G. Sun Kim. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those books are going to be awesome. We're going to have some parties and celebrate them in junks. We've got amazing interviews headed your way. And uh, here's the thing. We're, we're going through all the plans and everything for 218. If you have an idea, maybe someone that needs to be on the podcast or something we should think about doing or an event or a location or whatever, whatever it is, holler at me. 
trip at homebrewedchristianity.com. All right? And soon, I'm going to tell all the ATL peoples about when I'm coming to Atlanta. I'm just telling you. I'm not officially telling you. I'm just telling you. I'm going to tell you. Okay? Because it's going to be great. So until next time, I hope that you remember to ask yourself this Advent, what would St. Nick do? And if it does mean you might slap somebody with your shoe, don't do it. You don't have to follow all of his advice, okay? Don't slap, don't slap people with your shoe. It's just, it's regrettable. All right, Theology Nerds, for this segment, you get to experience Adam English, professor at Campbell University, my alma mater, where I met the most amazing human being on the planet, my wife. And uh, Adam taught me my uh, my last uh, philosophy class. So, Adam, I'm glad you were back on the podcast. It is awesome to be back with you. Of course, my uh, favorite student that I've ever had, oh. as, as you know. Of course, I also had your wife, so maybe I, I should maybe should withhold judgment. I don't know. You can't you can't have me as your favorite student this week because uh, your uh, PhD professor Roger Olson is currently mad at me on the internet. Um, oh no. <laughs> um, so, well, you know, maybe we'll get into that at the end, but currently we want to tell people about St. Nick because uh, you wrote a book, The Saint Who Would Be Santa Claus. And there is a hour and 20 minute discussion of this book and the historical St. Nick um, on the podcast. We'll link to it. But I thought we needed a real deal historical investigator of St. Nick on today because I, I, there is some confusion. Megan Kelly on Fox News um, told me that St. Nick is white, and people were upset. And to me, it just seemed really obvious, given how many pictures I have of him around the house, that he was white. Um, so could you just, you know, as a, as a story, and wrote a whole book on the historical St. Nick, uh, explain to us just how white St. Nick is. <laughs> you know, completely white, as white as Jesus was, according oh, to Megyn yeah. Kelly. Uh, Jesus was also just as white as as Nicholas. Um <laughs> And, uh, you know, I've actually heard that she has maybe recanted just a little bit and uh, is now saying that it, this is a a liberal conspiracy against her uh, to, to bring shame to her. So, you know, there you go. But uh, definitely not not um, of the European-American descent. St. Nicholas uh, was Mediterranean, you know, lived on the, the coast there of the Mediterranean Sea, would have been very dark-skinned. Oh, see, I thought the North Pole's so cold, there's not much light all year, so everyone up there's pasty. Yeah, now if she had said a Santa Claus is white, maybe she could have gotten away with that. <laughs> ah. <laughs> all right, so um, m- maybe you could just, just say a bit, because this is this is a season where, where St. Nick gets a lot uh, a lot of play. And, and, and you wrote this book on the, on the historical St. Nick. So w- what was it? Um, that uh, this weird combination of of history, culture, uh, the West, and its relationship with the church that 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 led to uh, such a popular figure being significantly kind of uh, jumbled up and and, and uh, a giant bunch of confusion around him. Well, you know, as you know, the the book really is about the historical person of Saint Nicholas, uh, but very quickly, I mean, within a hundred, two hundred years after Nicholas's death. Um, legends and other fairy tales quickly begin to attach themselves to him. He just is a very popular character um, uh, for among sailors and uh, children and um, bakers and butchers and, and everybody else. And so people want to tell stories about him. And of course, that's what we do at Christmas time. Everybody wants to watch a good holiday special on TV and uh, ha- have stories be told to them. So uh, very quickly, his historical story uh, gets converted into lots of different legends, which are all very fascinating. Uh, but again, what I found at the bottom of all those is a real, genuine historical character that I think oftentimes gets overshadowed. And and so uh, when you when you started investigating these stories, what um – what were the ones that kind of had historical resonance that when when uh, when they get retold, you think, ah, that is the real St. Nick coming out? You know, 
the famous one that we talked about last time, uh, the story of the three dowries, um, seems to have a significant historical basis to it. Uh, we talked on, on the last show about Nicholas being at the Council of Nicaea, and his, his name shows up there in the year 325. Uh, then there are a couple of other really interesting stories uh, where Nicholas, in one story, um, intervenes for the people of Myra. And uh, really, on two occasions, um, there's a famine in Myra, his his hometown, and Nicholas uh, bargains with a, a ship, a couple of ships that are taking grain uh, from Alexandria to Constantinople, and bargains for for grain for the people to help them through this time of famine. Uh, on another occasion, Nicholas travels 300 miles north to the capital at Constantinople to petition for lower taxes on behalf of the people. And these are, in some sense, are kind of unexpected stories, uh, especially things we wouldn't associate with Santa Claus doing, uh, really getting into public life and, you know, working for the welfare of the people. And, you know, it really is in these kind of stories that we see not only Nicholas doing good, but we see a subtle critique of the powers and the systems that are in place at the time. Um, and I think this might be one of the areas where we can really find um, some real-life application to Christmas today. I mean, Christmas mm-hmm. today and, and Santa Claus today has become so, so much connected with greed and desire and, <laughs> you know, gimme, gimme, gimme presents. Um, whereas uh, in these stories about Nicholas um, petitioning for lower taxes, Nicholas uh, saving the people from famine by um, bartering with this grain ship, you know, we see Nicholas doing more than just um, giving gifts, but really working for the welfare of the people. Uh, now here, this is a good question. You're starting to make this this the Saint Nick character sound too much like our Marxist Pope. So, um, the, this holiday season was all going good, where you know, um, upper middle class people spend lots of money on themselves, give twenty dollars, you know, disperse it over red buckets with people with uh with with bells, and, and you know, we have a great time um, consuming too many calories and and drinking eggnog and and that kind of stuff. Then. Then, then we have a pope running around, um, telling us that, uh, that there's an ideology of capitalism. We got Saint Nick here, you know, going up, um, uh, trying to do redistribution, um, making giant <laughs> systemic critiques. Can you, can you please, um, um, just, just try to talk me down from a ledge because it sounds like uh, a Saint Nick may not only have uh, not been white, but he may not have been uh, an American. He, it's very possible he was not an American, um, as it turns out. Oh. Very possible. Um, yeah, you know there is a there is a common sense about greed and, and avarice uh, that you know that everybody agrees with now, as they did back then. You know that that rich people should be open handed uh, and give their money, and that um, uh, you know the poor should. Um, you know, accept it generously. And so many of the ancient stories, even the Christian stories that involve giving, um, usually happen from one individual to another. I mean, think again about the story of the three dowries. You know, Nicholas is giving money to three poor girls, but nowhere in the story is any kind of system of oppression or, or, or institutions of poverty ever addressed. But what we find in some of the later stories is Nicholas, in some sense, challenging the systems that are creating situations or at least furthering situations of oppression. Um, you know, he's challenging some of the tax systems that are, are unfair to the people, the poor people of Myra. Uh, he's doing something by uh, by trying to provide grain during a time of famine for the entire city, and indeed even gets enough grain that the people are able to use some of it and plant for the next year. Um, These are stories that go beyond just the individual and their concerns to the entire social system. 
And, you know, that's a pretty radical message. It was radical then, and, and it's still pretty radical today um, when you think about it. So where uh, – I, I know a lot of our uh, our Protestant friends – um, just kind of started getting uh, uh, freaked out when when the Pope started, I don't know, saying things that are just normal Catholic social teachings out loud. But um, can, can you just say kind of the, the history of, of the, these kind of more systemic critiques and proclamations and, and that kind of stuff in the Catholic Church, that this isn't just a, a new news, but where does it come from? Yeah, obviously the Catholic Church has a long history, uh, going back to Pope Leo X um, in the late 1800s, of uh, kind of social critique, uh, and social justice issues, and critiques of capitalism, and that goes back to the Gospels. Uh, you uh. know, I mean, it's Jesus. I know, it, it blame Jesus for a lot of this. That uh, you know, of course, Jesus is you know regularly. Um, confronting the the ills of society and we find of course in the in the book of acts that the disciples are sharing what they have in common with each other and it's, it's setting up this very communist sounding society um so i think scripture presents us with a uh, you know not not a uniform picture to be sure um but but a mixed bag i mean there are moments of kind of genuine uh, communal living, but of course the Old Testament is also full of promises of prosperity and um, you know and healing and wealth and things like mm -hmm. this. And so um, I think there's plenty of material there for in the scriptures to critique uh, you know rampant capitalism, unbridled capitalism. Um, I I'm not sure that you could say there's a single unified economic strategy yeah. <laughs> in the well, Gospels or even in Jesus. Well, but what about the part where it says, you know, when you pass farm bills, make sure that we defund uh, food stamps and don't continue unemployment checks uh, during recessions because otherwise um, they uh, might stay unemployed. I, that uh, That's a really one of those moments where finally the Bible makes sense in the Christmas season. Mm-hmm. It, it really does. Um, and, you know, I think that's where, you know, Christians you know, should always be balanced out between a concern for justice and a concern for charity and, and love. So, you know, I think, I think the Old Testament prophets, prophets demand justice and the New Testament apostles demand love. And so if we keep those two things sort of at the, at the heart of our message, uh, Christians should be working for justice on in, in society. You know, but Christians also have a have a true demand to live out live out a life of love and and charity. And uh, those two expectations on us are always going to be, you know, central to the Christian life. It's always going to be dangerous, of course, for Christians to be pulled into a purely political answer either way. Uh, you know that the the Christian gospel is always always has real life social and political implications, you know, but can never be reduced to those things. Mm -hmm. And so I guess you know on either side. I mean, you see this with Nicholas as well. I mean, he he definitely he is motivated to engage society uh, at a very real practical social level, uh, and yet he continues to work as a Christian minister and preaching the gospel and, you know, sharing the love of Christ. And so, um, you know, th that's always going to be a difficult balance to maintain, uh, to not simply reduce Christianity down to a social teaching um, or to completely neglect uh, the social realities. And you know, that, that's always going to be difficult for Christians to try to strike that proper balance yeah, luckily these days we I I, I think uh, as long as we keep uh, turning uh, Saint Nick into uh, a Coca Cola icon, then <laughs> we kind of know where where the uh, where the problem lies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we could definitely do a lot better uh, with Nicholas, <laughs> uh, but you know, Nicholas gives us a good place to start because you know one tendency of Christians is to just in an attempt to try to save Christmas is to kill it, mm -hmm. right? 
to completely do away with all the Christian uh, the Christmas holiday festivities in order to save Christmas uh, as a, a Christian celebration. You know, well, that's you know that's that's going too far. That's going too extreme. You know, on the other hand, we might just totally give in to consumerism, capitalism, and uh, commercialism, <laughs> and just say, well, look, let's just not worry about the Christian side of it. Let's just give ourselves to, uh, you know, the Epicurean, uh, you know, frivolous uh, season of Santa Claus. Well, you know, neither one of those are great answers. I mean, so I think Nicholas provides us a model, uh, a way of holding on to the true Christian uh, message of the season, and yet also participate in real acts of giving and acts of community and acts of um, you know, communal celebrations. Mm-hmm. So you know, we've got to find some middle ground. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 there are a couple little topics in, uh, I, that are around this kind of Advent and Christmas season and, and the unique predicament I think we're in as a, a, a privileged people in the first world that I, I, I was kind of want to throw out and see uh, um, kind of how you would wrestle with it and how your time both as a uh, historical theologian and someone that spent a lot of time with uh, uh, the historical St. Nick, but also the lore around it and stuff. Uh, and as a dad, um, you kind of deal with them. So uh, mm-hmm. one is that, you know, we have this uh, hi- historical uh, stories being told um, during Christmas, be it about uh, St. Nick or uh, the birth of Christ. Um, we also have, um, the lore and mythology that de- develops around the different figures and the the way we try to narrate truths through telling of uh, stories that aren't in, you know fully historical, and then we also have uh, for both of these figures are pointing to this mystery of mm. the gift giving God, the one who comes to be with us incarnate and that kind of thing. Um, and, and yet, as a parent and and as a as a scholar, um, how do you kind of negotiate? Um, the way we deal with the history parts, the the kind of lore and mythology parts, and then, uh, but while preserving uh, the mystery, yeah, it is very difficult. Uh, you know, it really just depends on you know who your audience is at the moment. Uh, obviously, I'm going to speak to children differently than adults. Uh, you know, when I talk about Nicholas with children, I just like to say, look, I want to tell you about the first Santa Claus. Um, you know, St. Nicholas, who was the first Santa Claus. He didn't live at the North Pole, but, uh, you know, let me tell you about some of the things he did. So, I mean, there's a place to start and make those connections. Uh, you know, I've always just believed that uh, the real-life story is as interesting or more interesting than any of the farcical fantasies uh, that we could make up about the person. And so I think if we, you know, just have faith that <laughs> the, the real story will We'll do the work and, and carry the day, um, you know, then we should go there. But I also enjoy, you know, the different legends and, and stories about Nicholas. And, you know, so I think there's a place probably for all these things. And, you know, Christmas is a living tradition. Uh, and any living tradition is going to have um, – is not going to be static. You know, it's going to evolve. It's going to have changes. And so every year we're going to have new stories about Nicholas, new stories about Santa Claus. And, you know, that just shows us that the tradition is alive and, and healthy, you know, especially as you have people who are dressing up, playing the part of St. Nicholas and Santa Claus. Um, it's going to call for and invite uh, all kinds of – uh, developments and evolutions and, you know, changes to the story. So, you know, that's that's part of, you know, that's part of being human and living in a culture is just mm-hmm. watching these traditions change and grow and develop. Uh, you know, as long as we don't completely lose uh, the the real and historical person, um, you know, I'm, I'm okay with it. So, so what do you do with the clashing calendars? We have um, we have the the kind of a uh, cultural calendar, um, and I guess Christmas starts uh, November first. Um, we have our, <laughs> our our school calendars, we have our work calendars with, with vacations that are timed around certain times, and then we also have the liturgical calendar that is uh, uh, still in Advent, um, and and then you have the twelve days of Christmas. Um, could you could you maybe for Christians who may aren't familiar with the liturgical calendar introduce uh, the two seasons where that kind of stuff comes from and and then what is it like to try to 
uh, to to uh, use the liturgical calendar um, as a, a, a kind of a spiritual assistance amidst all these other um, calendars that are going on in our lives. I'm glad you brought up that point, Trip, because in some ways I'm very passionate about Christian time. Um, you know, in some sense, maybe the most radical act of discipleship uh, that Christians can do today is to uh, get ourselves onto Christian time. You know, we are conditioned by uh, the work week, by the hours of work, and by the, you know, the 12-month calendar. Um, you know, those things shape your lives. I mean, if you see your week as being Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, um, you are your life is being shaped by your work, but the Christian calendar offers something different, that our hours should be shaped by the hours of prayer, that our week should begin on Sunday and end on Saturday, uh, you know, the hours of worship. And certainly the calendar, you know, it's, it's not a 12-month calendar. It's a calendar that is divided up by certain major feasts and holidays and as we remember the Christian drama beginning with the Advent, beginning with the coming of Christ, um, which happens four Sundays out from Christmas and moving towards that Christmas day, uh, but then continuing on to Epiphany and to the time of Lent and then to the time of Easter and the, the remembrance of Christ's death and His resurrection. And, you know, so I think here's a place where we can do something very simple but is very revolutionary and resistive of uh, of the culture, and um, and challenging to the culture. You know, are we going to allow our lives to be determined by uh, the hours we work and by our work schedule, and or are we going to have our lives be determined by hours of prayer and days of worship? You know, so I think it's just those little mental shifts like that. Uh, the way that we look at our calendar and the way that we schedule our lives, you know, people will will bend heaven and earth uh, to fit their work schedule, but very rarely will anyone bend anything to fit uh, the church calendar uh, or church obligations. And you know, there's something not quite right about that. Uh, if this is our first priority, it, it should show itself in the way that we organize our time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I very much think, you know, if Christians out there looking for small ways to to really invigorate their discipleship, you know, look to the church calendar. Look to how you organize your, your very day. A lot of times, especially in evangelical church, you know, they'll emphasize having a quiet time or, uh, you know, having time of reading your Bible or something like this. You know, but we need to think more globally, more largely than just 15 minutes of Bible study a day. You know, let's think about the whole calendar here, uh, the way we organize our week and our month and our year. So, anyways, yeah, you've definitely jumped on it. <laughs> oh no! So, so <laughs> how do you? Uh, so, how do you, as a as as a family man, um, help the Advent season be where y'all are living right now and not? Um, you know, two months of Christmas. You know, we do a lot of the, I mean, obviously we, we, we get a Christmas tree and, and put up lights and we do a lot of those kinds of things as well. Um, you know, but what we're really trying to do is to uh, really celebrate St. Nicholas Day, you know, and, and really try to do some uh, acts of service on that day. I, I think, you know, that, that, that at the Christmas season, you know, we have oftentimes, we didn't this year because we're, we're traveling, but we'll oftentimes make our own little Advent wreath for our own home and light that every day. I mean, you can put it, if you have a coffee table or something like that, have your own Advent wreath with the Advent candles on it. And, um, you know, it's a way of sort of centering the season. Mm -hmm. uh, as you have all these other Christmas decorations around, you have, they're kind of at the center uh, this Advent wreath, and you're lighting it each day. So many people have Advent calendars, of course, but the Advent wreath really helps bring things into focus. Uh, you can obviously do, you know, Scripture readings for the different days of Advent. I mean, if you have an Advent calendar, uh, how hard would it be to add in, uh, you know, an Advent reading for each day? 
you know, so I think there's ways that you can do things that would be family friendly, but it would also add more significance, um, you know, to the to the year. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just one other little thing that I found, and I'll I'll just share it with you. Um, I don't know if you've heard of um, Salt of the Earth, a Christian Seasons calendar. Um, but if you look up, it's actually a website, so, you know, the christiancalendar.com, <laughs> uh, this church oh, yeah. out in Vancouver, they, Canada. They actually mail, they sent the podcast, quite a few of them, and um, uh, they're really cool. Yeah, it's a Christian uh, calendar for the year. So as opposed to your 12-month calendar, typical 12-month calendar, it divides it up by the Christian season. You know, well, it's just little creative moves like that that help us see the season differently. You know, Wittgenstein talked about seeing it as, you know, a lot of times that's just it. Our perspective uh, just has, a, has to have a little bit of a change just to see it as something else or as what it really is. Mm-hmm. Uh, we take it for granted again that this, you know, it's a, a 12-month calendar. But to see it as something different, we take it for granted that Christmas is this one day of, year, of the year. Uh, but can we see it as a season of Advent um, and begin to use that kind of language in our own homes? Yeah. You know, I think it would just shift everything. So uh, uh, last question, and, and I, I, I'm interested in uh, how you respond to it. And without a uh, – I'll try not to say what I think, but um, if, if you heard of the shelf, the elf on a shelf? I have. We do not have an elf on the shelf at our house. But I am very familiar with said elf on shelf. I know. So, so, I mean, I get the idea of hiding an elf every day in creative places. But um, um, what what is being uh, what what could be you know, going on if you're a nerd and you're looking there at uh, people creatively hiding an elf that is intensely watching you throughout as Christmas nears to report to Saint Nick. Um, uh, I know, I know tons of parents, uh, that think this is the greatest thing of all time and some that don't, but still do it anyway. Um, so, so w- what do you think about an elf on a shelf and would St. Nick have one? You know, uh, St. Nick has a lot worse. Actually, the, the elf on the shelf, the worst that the elf on the shelf is, is just kind of creepy. But uh, in a lot of the European countries, uh, Nicholas travels with uh, Krampus, who is, you know, this um, bent back, you know, really dirty looking, grimy forest character that's always kind of snarling. And uh, sometimes he travels with Rupert Connect, and uh, sometimes he just travels with these different, you know, wild men who carry around sacks, but they're not full of toys. They're actually empty, and they're, they're for stuffing bad children into them and carrying them off to the woods. And um, they'll travel around with switches and sticks for beating children. And um, so there's, uh, you know, the elf on the shelf is maybe a very pleasant version of these dark creatures that travel with St. Nicholas in many European countries, actually in Switzerland, uh, Nicholas travels just with the devil. <laughs> they don't even try to give it another name. It's just the devil. He's horned. He's got red eyes. He's covered in fur, and uh, he's there to sort of scare the children. And you know, you can watch out over them and report back to Nicholas about uh, any bad behavior. And so, you know, um, having a little creepy. <laughs> Guy in the house, uh, you know, it's, that's also part of the Christmas tradition, you know. <laughs> but uh, Nicholas would approve of this, I think, <laughs> as, as sad as it is. All right. Well, there you have it. Uh, you, you may, you can now tell your your children uh, things about the historical Saint Nick, um, and then uh, and then tell them about Satan with sacks to stick them in. You're like, yeah, yeah. you better, you better sh- you, look. Elf on a shelf. You better get good reports because when she calls for reinforcement. Let me tell you who comes, Satan. Yeah, you don't want Krampus to show up. <laughs> now, this is this is basically material for the Christmas episode of Grimm or something like that. That's what that's what oh, it yeah. sounds like. <laughs> it, it really is. Well, it's just almost like an extension of Halloween into the Christmas season. All right, so now we're transitioning into sections about Saint Nick from the other time I interviewed him. 
Hello, Homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and we have a return visit from Adam English out in the wonderful world of the buoys of the creek. That is uh, where Campbell University is, where I went for undergrad. And uh, Adam is back, and this time we're going to talk about St. Nick, Santa Claus, and his new book, The Saint Who Would Be Santa Claus, The True Life and Trials of the Good Old St. Nick. Uh, So, Adam, thanks for coming back on the podcast. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, um, I, I was quite excited when I saw this book was coming out. Then I realized it was attached to someone I knew, which is even better, so it wouldn't be a cold email um, requesting to, to uh, chat. Uh, and, and so I'm interested not only in the, the history and the nerdy side of, uh, of, of kind of what you, what you uncover and talk about in the book, but, but also um, the questions as just a, a, a Christian dad who mm-hmm. has this cultural thing of Santa Claus – and this real saint in our history that the church is even kind of confused about who he was, what he was, what he did, and why he did it. Um, and then, you know, that kind of situation where you're stuck deciding how you participate and don't participate in the Advent season and in the Christmas season and in the cultural consumer part of Christmas. Mm-hmm. So uh, maybe you could just begin there. Like, uh, yes, you have a, where are you as a scholar coming at beginning a work on the historical St. Nick, but also where were you as a, as just a, a Christian and a father and that kind of thing coming to the work? My story is uh, from an evangelical point of view. I, you know, I was raised in a good uh, you know, conservative evangelical Christian home and my parents really struggled with, just exactly what you're talking about. Um, they they wanted us to be, uh, you know, good Bible believing uh, Christians. So they constantly reiterated, you know, Jesus is the reason for the season. But then they also wanted us to have the joys of Christmas morning and unwrapping presents left mysteriously under the tree, you know, and have all of those things as well. So they they really struggled. Uh, you know, between those two worlds, between uh, wanting to celebrate Christmas, but then also wanting to say, but this is not the real reason for the season. You know, it's this other thing. So, you know, as I uh, grew up, of course, uh, loving the Santa Claus traditions, but also as a Christian, confused about it, wanting to know more, wanting to figure out what, what is the right Christian balance that can be struck here, and discovering the historical real person of Nicholas really was um, an answer to prayer. It really was the perfect solution, because here you have a way to not only reclaim and, and keep some of the, f- the fun family Christian traditions, but also to be able to re-energize the faith and say, you know, we don't have to simply say no to Santa Claus. We can say yes to Nicholas and realize that we are celebrating um, the life of a good Christian, someone who's modeled for us charity and virtue and justice and, you know, all those things that we want to teach our children. Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe you could say a little bit about this because, um, you know, for for Christians, especially those that are engaged in some kind of academic work, there's long been this kind of tradition where, oh, we, you know, we take this stuff we learn about um, first century Judaism, the historical Jesus and stuff, and it helps us re-engage um, with our Christology or reading the text in their context and picking up on these uh, cultural or contextual nuances of the stories or teachings of Jesus or what was the early church's theological telling of a story versus what happened. And th- we, I mean, people are familiar with the way the historical Jesus and the Christ of faith are kind of connected connected and not the same. Um, but what what about, uh, how is, I guess, the investigation different when you're beginning with someone who, early on in the book, you point out that even the historians kind of confuse one St. Nicholas with another St. Nicholas, and most people are really, really familiar with uh, Coca-Cola's, um, uh, I don't know what you ever, the Gnostic account or something, I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> This is really the challenge of studying Nicholas, of the scholarship here, because you have so much legend that is so tightly woven with the character and so much of the fact that gets stretched into the legend, into farce, into myth. Um, you know, it it is very daunting uh, to unpack the real truth. And it's the uh, complexity is only enhanced by the fact that 
Nicholas himself did not leave letters or sermons or any writings, and and by the fact that none of his contemporaries, those who lived in his day and time, mention him by name. So his historicity, I'm, I'm quite convinced he actually existed, but uh, if, by a number of reasons. But um, it gets very it gets very difficult to really pin down the actual truth of this man since everything we have about him comes from later generations. And then you have to really start looking for clues towards authenticity within those later reports. Um, you know, even just minor things like uh, specific names of individuals that you could cross check and locations that you could verify uh, things like that that would indicate a historical authenticity. Uh, but yes, I mean, the work becomes very difficult uh, at one point. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I like about the book, and one of the reasons that um, I've recommended it to a number of of, of like educated lay people who've kind of just had the St. Nick Santa Claus question is that um, that you do a good job in the book, not just kind of, oh, here are the stories that have been collected, and here's kind of how we can think about them, but you frame them all in uh, the kind of historical period of the church. This kind, of, this transition point of the Roman Empire becoming Christian, um, the connections of Saint Nick at Council of Nicaea, and different ways of seeing it. You help us understand what's going on um, when you hear these kind of grandiose tales of medieval Christians about the saints and that kind of thing. Um, that that the book itself, on top of learning what we can kind of gather from history about St. Nick and how that could uh, be incorporated in in our kind of understanding of Christmas and the season and the character. But um, it also uses this person we are completely fascinated with as a culture as a way to um, introduce uh, this transition period in Mm -hmm. church history. Um, There's no doubt that St. Nicholas lived in an extraordinary time. When he was born, Christianity was a persecuted minority religion, when he dies, Christianity is not only legalized, or has been legalized, but it's the favored religion of the empire at this point. And you know, people by the droves are come entering the church, being baptized. Uh, it's a huge transformation. Uh, one of the real discoveries for me was to see, you know, how much of Nicholas' story involves him sort of battling paganism. So as they're making this transition towards a more Christianized society, uh, you have all of these little flowerings and varieties of paganism uh, that he has to confront and really challenge, um, sometimes in love, sometimes with the hammer, <laughs> um, you know, doing it in ways that we would probably find l- less than appealing in a, a more modern, tolerant world that we live in now. But you know, there's no doubt that you know this period really is crucial, really is seminal in the development of Christianity. He attends the Council of Nicaea, as you mentioned in 325, which uh, has to be maybe the most important church council in all of Christian history. Um, and so he really is there at a pivotal moment. And you know that that part is what really fascinates me about him as a historical character. Uh, just to see all these other pieces swirling about. And yet you have someone who is trying to live the life of a a good Christian pastor and patron of the people um, and defending and protecting and teaching the people of Myra. Early in the book, you um, kind of bring up even these stories like uh, that St. Nick, um, even as an infant, uh, while breastfeeding, fasted on the fast days. Um, and, and you know, some of us are, will hear that and go, "Now this sounds crazy." Like, how do you actually go find that out? And and, and what was going on? And you kind of end that section with this, uh, with this, with a line. You said that in um, med- medieval Christians were more concerned with the spiritual, eternal value of a life than with its temporal, physical operations. They did not set about to distort. They simply wanted to draw out and enhance the lessons. Uh, you know, for for those of us that ever took a uh, history class, um, we might hear that and go, oh, "Come on, Adam, do you do you know what the there's fact section and a fiction section?" Right, and right. It seems like you're just making excuses for people who want to talk about a baby that fasted from the breast. Right. This is 
I think, especially as modern people, modern Christians, modern scholars, uh, our real challenge when we when we encounter hagiography, when we encounter the lives of the saints, we just don't know what to do with them because they fall in between, you know, fact and fiction. They're 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 in the gap. They're neither fact nor fiction. Uh, they're somewhere in between, and we just don't have a place in our minds to compartmentalize them. So I actually taught a course, you know, here at Campbell, it was an honors course on saints and it was so difficult for the students and frustrating for me. And I mean, just everybody was frustrating because we're reading the lives of these saints, many of which interweave uh, fact and fiction, legend and history. And the students just had no idea what to do with it because they had been trained sort of in this di dichotomy, you know, two mode operation of either it's fact or it's fiction, you know, and the saints, I think part of the saints lives are challenging us to see beyond the merely physical world. They know as well as anybody that some of these things are, are stupendous and miraculous and maybe even fictionalized, but they're trying to get us to see deeper truths and you know that's always been part of the Christian claim is that the world is denser uh, than we can imagine. It's it's there are deeper realities. There are spiritual truths. You know there is the seen and the unseen world. And so I think the saints' lives are trying to kind of force some of those boundaries and cross some of those very uncomfortable boundaries uh, that we we try to set up. Um, so. I think it's it's a good exercise to read the lives of the saints, uh, just to challenge us to think spiritually about our own existence. I thought maybe one might be just Saint Nick's own the kind of saint, the stories about Saint Nick around giving, um, and uh, and how they they got told the lore around them, but also um, how uh, Saint Nick's kind of practice of giving can kind of impact us as Christians in our kind of present context. He if if people know a story about the original St. Nicholas, typically it is this one standout story of his generosity. Uh, he's a young man, not yet a pastor or a bishop, uh, but he's inherited a sizable amount from his deceased parents. And he hears of three you know, young ladies who are on the doorstep of destitution. You know, they're one foot in the poorhouse, and uh, he decides to act, and so bags up uh, an amount of gold and you know, in the middle of the night, tosses it anonymously through the window and then returns to do this, the same thing two more times to save these girls from a life of despair and, and hopelessness. And, you know, it's that act really that just strikes up the imagination of people at the time, just as it still does today. But people are still moved by that story and should be because it's, it's, it doesn't involve anything miraculous or anything supernatural. It's completely ordinary. Uh, it's the kind of thing anybody could do. So that already by the 1100s in France, you have nuns who are, who are making little toys and then leaving them on the doorsteps of children and signing them from St. Nicholas. And you, you have people there you are now making these anonymous St. Nicholas gifts because anybody can do this, and it's the right thing to do. And so, even at Christmas time here, we can, you know, we can maybe go and buy a bag of groceries and just leave them on the doorstep of somebody that we know is struggling financially. Uh, and we hear stories about people going into Walmart and paying off uh, the layaway bill of somebody they've never met. Those are inspiring acts uh, because, again, they're they're acts that are, in some sense, ordinary but so obvious. And yet, so deeply Christian, uh, you know. I think Nicholas really gives us a model of what, you know, what Christian charity looks like, what Christians should be doing. Uh, it's one thing to read theological treatises, and you know, I'm like you. I'm a, I'm a theologian at heart, and, and I want to read good theology. But you know, every now and then, you just need someone to give you the obvious example. And here's what you should be doing with your time and your money. And, uh, and Nicholas does that for us. He ended up becoming a bishop pretty young and then finds his way uh, to the Council of Nicaea. He is born in Patera, which is uh, the southern coast of what is now Turkey. 
and uh, he is made bishop of a church in, in Myra, uh, which is a nearby town, again, on the coast of southern Turkey. And it does happen. He's probably at the, around the age of 30 or a little after. Um, and, you know, there's sort of a, a miracle associated with with that naming of him as bishop. He, uh, the town of Myra is without a bishop, and uh, the sur- bishops from the surrounding area have gathered together to elect someone. No one has come forward. No one has entered their minds as a good candidate uh, until one night one of one of the bishops receives a vision or has a vision or somehow knows in his gut that the first person to walk through the door of the church in the morning who is named Nicholas is going to be their next pastor, their next bishop. And of course this sounds like you know, this will never happen. You know, but sure enough the first person to walk through the door in the church in the morning is this young man named Nicholas and he's declared bishop on the spot. Uh, he he is bishop at a very crucial time. When he becomes bishop, it's right around the time of a very severe outbreak of persecution around the year 303, um, when the last and, and most severe uh, persecution of the church. Uh, there are indications that he suffered somehow from this, either imprisonment or some kind of torture. We're not given the specifics of it, um, but... He did live through it. You know, he did, he did not suffer a martyr's death. Um, but ultimately, you know, the emperor Constantine is going to liberate first the West and then the East, where Nicholas is, in about the year 324, and then immediately the next year call for this big Council of Nicaea, which is so important because, um, you know, it's the first really ecumenical or worldwide council of Christians and we have it really at this council, uh, really we're hammering out who is Jesus Christ, uh, who are we as Christians, you know, what is it that's going to hold us together as a united church. Um, there's so many important decisions, there's so much that goes into that council. You know, Nicholas there now is an, is an older gentleman, an older bishop, um, but um, part of those proceedings you know, it really is monumental um, to have him there. And there, there are a couple of legends with him at the council. We've talked about this on other occasions, uh, which unfortunately are not true. Uh, one of the, the best legends has Nicholas um, sitting there and, and hearing Arius, who was kind of the arch heretic at the time, spouting off his heresies, saying something to the effect that Jesus is not truly divine, uh, but just a mere man, and Nicholas leaps to his feet and, and slaps him, um, which unfortunately is not true and not in, the, not in the historical record. It's a later medieval invention, but, you know, gosh, that would be really cool if it was. Oh, yeah, I, it is, because that's my favorite of all the stories, um, is uh, Santa, Santa Claus slapping Arius with his with his sandals? The version I'd heard. Yeah, you can and, tell your your t shirts. Huh? Yeah, yeah. My, I've I've used the story before, and um, uh, that that Saint Nick got really mad at Arius and slapped him with a sandal. They put him in prison, and uh, there, Jesus's mom came and uh, put. I mm-hmm. guess like the you know made him a bishop or something like that is what I'd heard. Like Mary visits, gives him the Bible, puts a robe on him. So when they all come down, they're like, "Hey, Arius was condemned a heretic. You were right, Saint Nick." And he's like, mm-hmm. "Bam, Mother Mary came. Yes, there was never a time when the sun was not." And uh, um, so my youth, who uh, during confirmation have I guess decided that I'm an Ari- Arian, um, uh got me a t-shirt with St. Nick holding a, th- with a threatening face, holding a uh, sandal that said, I got sandal slapped by St. Nick. Oh, that's so awesome. And, uh, that is truly a, an awesome t-shirt. It is it, it, there. So I don't want, I don't want them to listen to this part and ruin it. Cause that's right. <laughs> you know, some, it's like the gospel of John. You're like, well, it is the, the eternal St. Nick has always that's sided right. for, for the, uh, <laughs> full divinity of jesus but maybe you should say just a bit about um 
uh, historically, because that's one of the things about the book is it, it takes these stories and unpacks what's going on. Um, maybe you can explain uh, if people all oh, the time when the sun was not there. That's what Arius is saying. What does that even fight about? If you are not a straight up theology nerd, why would anyone really get a council together for the first time to decide whether or not the son is co-eternal with the father? What does that mean? And why would someone get so worked up about something, you know, I don't, I mean, I guess St. Nick's not co-eternal that he would, you know, theoretically slap a face with his shoe. So what is it about that question that even matters today? That seems like an odd um, question. It does, it does. You know, and there's a, a letter that Gregory of Nazianzus writes in which he, he talks about that people are arguing about the nature of the sun in the bathhouses and in the streets. There are riots over this. And it's just a, unimaginable to think today, you know, of people, you know, debating and rioting, uh, you know, over such a, such a minor, seemingly minor piece of, uh, you know, theology. Um, which for us today, I mean, it's hard for us to even get what's at stake, and yet it was it it caused such passions in its day. You know, essentially, it, it really was a question of the heart of the Christian faith. What what do we believe about Jesus? And you know, if Christianity is anything, it's about Jesus. Uh, that's Christianity is Christ, and Christ is Christianity. Uh, so. If our belief in Jesus is wrong, uh, you know, then everything else <laughs> is is going to be off as well. So they realized that there was there was a big matter at stake, and no no one had yet really defined uh, Jesus's relationship with God. Um, so you know, certainly in the scriptures, there are indications that Jesus is divine? Yes, I mean, that's very clear in Scripture, but the question really is how divine? Uh, you know, as divine as the Father, or somewhat less? So, I mean, I think it's important to know that everybody who attended the Council of Nicaea, and even Arius, would have said, Jesus is divine. Yes, he's divine. They just disagreed on how divine is Jesus. You know, like, halfway divine, a little divine, 100% divine, as divine as the Father. And so that's where the real disagreement was. Uh, Arius wanted to say, uh, you know, Jesus is divine, yes, the Son is divine, but just not as divine as the Father. The Father is unbegotten, and the Son is begotten. So that just, that very term, that very distinction is what distinguishes them. The unbegotten, eternal Father, and then the begotten, or made, or created Son. Mm -hmm. uh, the Father has no beginning, and the Son has a beginning. So for him, that clearly indicated the Father is superior. You know, the Father has no beginning, the Son has a beginning, so you know, fa the Father is over the Son. The Son is subordinate to the Father. And the Council of Nicaea ultimately ruled against him and said, no, we, we have to say the Son is co-eternal with the Father. They are the same being. Uh, you didn't have, first of all, the Father, and then later on in, in history, the creation of the Son. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, of course, we're talking about acts that happen in eternity. So already our minds are pretty stretched to try to think about an eternal act or something, but uh, the declaration was, you know, the Son has existed from eternity with the Father. So there's an eternal begetting of the Son, an eternal sending of the Son, and an eternal return of the Son. Uh, so it's, it's not a, a beginning date uh, for the Son. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Cappadocians end up using the phrase, I think they get it from Athanasius, that the Father is um, eternally generates the Son, and mm -hmm. that like God's identity wasn't, oh, here's God, oh, now we have the Son, and now the mm -hmm. Son does his little Logos thing, and now we have the world, and now the Logos goes into Jesus, incarnate, to redeem it, and then it all comes subject to the Son, then back to the Father, and now we can have just God in the world again in unity. Um, that uh, their whole, the, the line that is that you couldn't be a father without a son, you couldn't be a son right. without a father, and God's identity is the Trinity, not 
um, not the Trinity is some neat way of getting at how we talk about God as Christians, but God is God, God's name is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that kind of thing. Um, That's exactly right. And you know, it's something we take for granted today, and we shouldn't. I mean, we we should be investigating this all the time. But uh, you know, the early Christians realized you know this is a make or break issue. I mean, this is either we believe you know in one God, or we end up believing in two or three gods you know, two or three different emanations of a God, or we believe that Jesus is really not all that divine. Or, I mean, right, it just, it really does have significant implications, um, even though the, the debate is very technical. Um, it, it's one worth having. There's some debates that are technical and not worth having. <laughs> yes. And then there are others that are technical and really are worth having. Mm-hmm. In the, in the, uh... In Nazianzus's sermons on on the incarnation, uh, when I took the kind of development of the Trinity class, the thing that kind of stuck out to me most, and uh, and now most of my very you know my Orthodox friends, I mean with big O like Eastern Orthodox ones, won't count me among their ranks or anything. But <laughs> one of the things in his sermons, he made a point. He said, "Well, if you think that that Jesus is this story about a guy who you know was divine in some way, and it tells us something about God and." You can trust it, but you don't want to say that the that the one who was incarnate in Christ is the co-eternal Son and that kind of thing. Uh, he said, "Then you you have a really good view of yourself." Was not the yeah. answer's point. He said, "You mm. you really think we have permission to to run around and baptize people, serve communion, and invite them into the divine life if we aren't really sure the divine life has given it to us?" Um, and the when you when you dr- start to draw distance between God as God is in God's self, and for Christians that would be like the triune God, and Mm -hmm. how you talk about God if you're simply just inspired or encouraged or enabled to with the story of Jesus being one way you can kind of talk about God. He said, then, uh, Nazianzu says, "Then, then you don't really understand the giant distance between us as human beings and God. We don't get to talk about God and jump this giant ontological gap between the finite and infinite. We don't get to ascend there, and we don't get to go there with our brains. We only get to talk about it because uh, because God has has come to us and given us the tongues to say it. And um, when you start to see it that way, then all of a sudden these weird fights that they're having in the councils are actually fights over um, it. Uh, are we how are how can we articulate the confidence we have to proclaim the good news we have in Christ? And because if it's not God's good news, then you know, are we just speaking things to ourselves to help us sleep well, keep our kids from using drugs and having sex, and we die with smiles on our face, or what? You know, like are we? In what ways is the gospel we're telling really have traction with who God is? Is it God's yeah. word or our word about God and that kind of thing? That's great. I mean, and so ultimately. All of the councils, I mean, the end result is not to explain the incarnation. And that's maybe as students, we come at it and, you know, we want to know, okay, what's the explanation? And you know, they're, they're wrestling with these questions. They must be giving, finally, some kind of explanation. How does the incarnation work? How does the Son's relationship with the Father work? And, you know, how does the Trinity work, right? What's the aha explanation? That's not their point. Their point is to protect the mystery of the Trinity, to protect the mystery of the Incarnation, to bring us to the to the divine and say, you know, this is divine. It's, it's not going to get an explanation, precisely because we're dealing with God here. So there are appropriate ways to talk about the mystery and to name it, but then we start to overstep ourselves when we begin to offer explanations for it. and. I mean, that's just what's pro- the problem with Arius is that it's an explanation of how God works. Okay, so I can, I can, okay, you know, you've got a father who has a son who then gives birth to the spirit or whatever. I mean, you can kind of see all that happening, you know, mechanically, and that's just exactly what's wrong with it. Uh, it's the Trinity is not a mathematical equation to be worked out. It's a deep divine mystery, you know, to be. Reverence. What kind of questions, um, practical ones or suggestions, do you think the kind of Christological heart of St. Nick poses towards the way we as a church today um, uh, 
celebrate Christ and talk about Christ in the Christmas season? Well, it's always important at the Christmas season to name what's happening here in the Incarnation. This is Emmanuel, God with us, uh, Christ in our midst, uh, God come to earth. I mean, that's the mystery and the excitement of Christmas is that, you know, here it is that we we see who God is most personally and most deeply, and he's this weak, innocent little child in the manger. Uh, so there's there should always be something startling about Christmas that sort of knocks us back a little bit. We want God to come riding a chariot and throwing spears and, you know, sounding the trumpet. You know, but at Christmas, uh, we're demanded to be quiet. The baby is sleeping, you know, and, and, and sit there in silence as, um, as we ponder the mystery of, of God's weakness among us. Um, who, who identifies with our weakness and uh, takes on our human form. Uh, and so there, there's a true mystery here that, you know, thinking about the councils, thinking about the nature of Christ, you know, I think really adds something very significant to the Christmas celebration. The story about his relation to uh, Muhammad, I, that was, I'd never heard that before. <laughs> Um, some riots and beheadings and these kinds of other things that are um, uh, maybe uh, not fit for uh, for children's time, but are, are thoroughly fascinating and help us as Christian to ask different questions today about um, our relationships with others this time of year. You know, that, that, that story you're referencing, I love because it is so un-Christmassy. It shows such another side of St. Nicholas. We, we do attach him with generosity, with charity. And that's all right and good, but there's another side of Nicholas that is very much concerned with justice and uh, with with fairness. And so there's this story. Actually, this is maybe the very first story about Nicholas that gets circulated around uh, in, in the early 500s, a story in which Nicholas uh, stops a beheading. Three innocent men are about to be, you know, beheaded, and he puts an, a stop to it, and um, in that story, he's working as social activist, as judge, as lawyer, as patron of the city. Uh, you know, he, he goes and confronts the governor who is, has, has miscarried justice here and reprimands him. Uh, he is acting more than just a Christian pastor. He's acting as a true you know, civil servant and, you know, civil activist. Uh, he's getting out there in the streets and mixing it up. That strong sense of justice and concern for fairness has, uh, has stayed with his legend and lore in some interesting ways. For instance, even today, you know, we, we picture Santa Claus as going over his naughty and nice list uh, and, and maybe <laughs> leaving a lump of coal or a switch or something like that. I mean, really, you know, you see in that uh, the echo of this other strand, this virtue of justice and fairness that show up so prominently there in that story. And then again, we still have just maybe a residue of uh, Nicholas who is going to weigh out your deeds and give a fair and just, you know, judgment about them and, and maybe even leave you a lump of coal if that's what, you deserve, right? So, you know, of course, we've, we've more or less lost that side of it. Uh, but, it, but you know, it's there it's kind of in those funny little echoes. Uh, even uh, the picturing of St. Nicholas with a whip, uh, is, there's some medieval stories about him, you know, using that whip for more than just a horse, but uh, on, you know, bad monks. Uh, so even the idea of him carrying a whip has the connotation of him as a a just judge who's going to mete out punishment in some ways. Um, and although, again, we've kind of domesticated the, the whip, and you know, it's just a little token that he holds. Um, and by the way, have you heard uh, that this the other the other Saint Nicholas book that's coming out this Christmas is the Smokeless Santa? They're publishing a version of the Night Before Christmas without reference to Nicholas smoking. Uh, you know, there's that great line in there about uh, him in his 
you know, corn cob pipe and the, uh, the, the little ring of smoke that halos him. Uh, and they've taken out that, that entire reference, uh, so that you can have a, a smokeless Santa this Christmas. Oh, that's even more depressing. <laughs> it kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> no cigar, or corn cob pipe, or, or anything like that. Well, what about Frosty? <laughs> I guess he's going to have to lose it too. Um, maybe give him a candy cane instead. Yeah, that just no, but that's too much sugar. <laughs> we have an obesity well, epidemic. Now, now you know why he's so round. I mean, he's got to he's got to sustain his girth. Uh, <laughs> yes. On candy cane, sucking on candy cane. He's got to keep his figure. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been it's really interesting. It's been getting a lot of mixed reviews. I mean, the lady who published it, uh, she. You know, she is a big advocate against smoking and kids smoking and stuff like that. So she's doing it for all the right reasons. I mean, I think there is a sense in which Christmas is a season where we, where, um, because of the cultural excitement around the celebration of the kids, we decide to edit not just, you know, St. Nick and his kind of stands for justice. There's even that picture in the book of him holding the church in a sword. Um, right. Right, like that's never going to be on anyone's Christmas card. Um, no, and uh, you know we edit that in the text, like no Bethlehem massacre at the children's play. Um, oh yeah, Keep and that the kind fully of, innocence. Yeah, we, and and we really believe that baby Jesus could be fully human and completely silent right after his birth. Um, like there there are all right. these kinds of uh, we we edit for this cultural experience we have with our family. So I I I'm interested in in uh, how the you as having spent this time with St. Nick, um, what, what's your favorite story to tell? And, uh, and then what is that thing, that story when you got done, you were like, huh, really? Come on, Nick. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, I definitely, I mean, the favorite story has to be the, the story of the three, uh, three bags of gold that he gives, um, uh, you know, followed closely by that story that, you know, I was mentioning a minute ago of him, um, you know, saving three innocent men from, from death, uh, just because you have on the twin aspects of his generosity and his justice being shown. Um, but there, there are, there are many more. I mean, I think another really interesting story is him, uh, traveling to the capital to petition on behalf of his city for lower taxes. Uh, which again is a very un Santa Claus kind of thing to do, um, to have you know Saint Nicholas, you know, bickering over uh, taxation with with the emperor and and you know petitioning on behalf of his people. Um, so but, Saint yeah, Nick, go ahead. So Nick, Saint Nick was part of a a tea partier. So. <laughs> you know, I would hate to translate uh, ancient politics uh, onto modern ones in any way. Uh, you know, just totally different situations. Who knows what he would say today? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I do think it is interesting in the sense that the, um, I mean, even in that section of the book where you talk about uh, the taxes there are being levied for things like maintenance of the military um, and infrastructure, but the, but it, and and we kind of still do those things. Um, uh, but it was also. Uh, the religious way taxes was framed was problematic and um how exactly uh they were extracted and that um you know that that for saint nick there they the impact of the taxes on the so many of the people that he was caring for their souls was such it put them in an economic condition that um that god's goodness wasn't being reflected in their lives and so you know i do think there's a sense in which like that story is one of those others that could, to me resonated with that um, the Saint Nick um, actually standing up for those uh, who who needed it. That, that's exactly right. Um, you know the the ancient world. Uh, you know people lived day to day. They they were just they didn't have bank accounts. They didn't have credit cards. They didn't have savings. You know, so any kind of tax increase of any amount really could be devastating to a day laborer uh, when so many people live kind of as sustenance farmers. Um, you know, this is, I mean, here, this really is a jump. <laughs> uh, 
you know, this is part of the the December celebrations. You know, December marked the end of the harvest season. It also marked the time uh, when you could start slaughtering animals because now it's cold enough to preserve the meat. It was also the time of year when um, the beer and the wine were ready. Uh, and mm-hmm. so you have midwinter celebrations in which, you know, for people who may not get, you know, good beer and wine and meat uh, any other time of the year, you know, this is kind of their one shot at it. And so they're, you know, they're, they're gorging themselves and they're eating, you know, like mad and drinking like mad. And of course it's causing all kinds of ruckus uh, and carousing and mayhem, but it comes out of a, a true sad situation of scarcity. You know, we, we overeat and over drink in the holidays because we have an abundance. Uh, they did it because they lived lives of scarcity. And I mean, that's just always something to keep in mind. I think, you know, as we, as we judge backwards uh, on their actions is, is, you know, the desperate times in which people live for, you know, for hundreds of years. I mean, really up until just modern times, have we had an abundance of food, um, you know, good, good drink anytime we want it, um, good eats anytime we want them, fresh meat, you know, those, those kinds of things just were not available. And so, yes, I mean, you know, defending the people, uh, and, and arguing for lower taxes, you know, it was really the difference between life and death. I mean, we, we gripe about it today. Um, but it's not, for the most part, it's not going to cost anyone their life to pay a little more in tax. Um, it could, it could very easily do that in the ancient world. So Nicholas, uh, arguing for lower taxes, pleading the case of his city, you know, was doing a life saving work. Yeah, and, and 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 you even mentioned in there that he, that he was going on behalf to address uh, what he thought the emperor's greed. That part of it, mm-hmm. the request for higher taxes, is because emperor, the one who uh, would be benefiting from this, um, ha- had a greed issue, and mm-hmm. uh, and and that you know Nicholas kind of intentionally connects what he's doing to uh, Moses going into the fort of uh, to the court of the Pharaoh. So much of what we see as these kind of calls at Christmas for 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 charity and these kinds of things, you know that's a real big difference between showing up in the uh, uh, the play, the the people who make decisions over how the the livelihood of the many um, are kind of being affected and and advocating uh, on their behalf and mm-hmm. and recognizing um, what could be just you know political business. Oh, a king, emperors, they have to have armies, you need infrastructure and stuff. So it's just, you know, that's just normal business. Um, and, and he kind of comes as someone took a vow of poverty and saying, uh, you know, there, there are human consequences to, uh, to what you're doing. I think that's a powerful image because it's so much at Christmas. We don't want to look at, um, the way what we purchase, how we purchase and maybe over purchase and overspend, are connected to the lives of people um, elsewhere who are making our um, very cheap things. We use our surplus income to purchase, and uh, and and that's a story where perhaps Saint Nick is coming to our pocketbooks that we're yeah. planning on spending at Christmas and going. Well, you do know the consequences of what this is, Trip, right? You know, yeah, that's right. You might want to know who you're purchasing, where you're purchasing, whose lives are affected by uh, by what you're doing. You know, we're we things are so morally complicated for us. Uh, you know, we want to uh, get good deals on black Friday, you know, and we don't realize, so that may mean that employees have to come in, you know, Thursday night on Thanksgiving nights or, um, you know, get there at the crack of dawn on, on Friday or maybe come in at midnight or whatever. Um, and we would never say we're greedy, but in a sense it is our greed that's, it's our consumers and it's maybe forcing people to take on that extra shift or to come in, you know, leave family and come into work. And, um, you know, it gets very morally complicated for us. Um, and, and again, no one would say they're greedy or no one would do it out of greed, but you know, it's a whole system that gets going and 
we're unsure as how to slow it down or how to stop it or how to, how to reverse it a little bit. Um, you know, if one store is going to open instead of 10 o'clock, maybe we'll open at eight. What about the store store that opens at midnight? Mm -hmm. And then, well, if they're going to open at midnight, maybe we should open at 11 o'clock on, you know, and if they're going to open, you know, where does it stop? Eventually people just say, well, why don't we just be open on Thanksgiving day and you can come in any time and we'll be open all Thanksgiving day and that night. And you we know, can get a turkey night. slider food truck out in the parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just tough. And I'm not necessarily in favor of, you know, passing some kind of law about it or, or whatnot, but you know, individuals, communities, Christians, you know, we have to find ways to resist over commercialization and St. Nicholas helps us do that. I mean, to me, one of the real challenges that St. Nicholas gives us, if we want to reintroduce them into our Christmas celebrations is that, uh, you know, when you have Santa Claus, I'm not against Santa Claus. Uh, Santa Claus allows us to have a warm, fuzzy family affair on Christmas morning but when you reintroduce St. Nicholas, he's going to challenge you to do more than simply family giving. He's going to challenge you to give to those whom you do not know or do not have a relationship, to reach out to your community. Um, so I, I, I'm not against a domestic, warm family Christmas. You know, but at some point in that holiday season, you know, St. Nicholas would have us move beyond the family walls and remember our community. Remember those who are less fortunate and, and do something for them. And I'd be interested in what y'all do in uh, the English home. One of the things uh, Alicia and I did was we just kind of just tell St. Nick stories um, to Elgin. And, and he kind of comes up based off what he hears with all of his friends, um, how St. Nick and Santa Claus are related. Um, his current theory is that, uh, that San all the Santa Claus – people that dressed up like him and bring stuff to people's houses, they all work for St. Nick. And, uh -huh. um, and we kind of have a rule where, you know, Jesus only got three gifts from the wise men, so it's not good to get more gifts than the birthday boy. So <laughs> you're just kind of, you don't get more than three, um, which is nice. So grandparents, the two sets of grandparents and us can do something, and then, you know, uh, birthdays are, he has his own birthday. So the we kind of do that, and then St. Nick sends Elgin, you know, a letter and, and says, you know, after he's heard the story about giving and stuff like that, says, oh, you know, some people in your, in your, um, in your city, you know, there's some that don't have food and clothes and they need stuff. And here's some things you could get. If you could fill up your stockings, then, um, um, uh, then Santa Claus would pick them up and then take them to someone else in town that needs them that night. And so what we did was, um, based off his rather weird connection between St. Nick and Santa Claus, that they all work for him, um, He's, he does uh, – we leave stuff out for St. Nick, and then Santa Claus comes and picks them up and then you know sends him uh, and leaves him a letter uh, that uh, mysteriously was printed on our computer um, uh, that uh, – saying how much, you know, how much he really appreciates people that are uh, continu they're continuing what, what he's done and uh, making this a time where we receive the gift of God and Christ – and then share that through compassion towards others. Um, and so now, you know, now he's ready. He's been waiting to get the, either the phone call or letter from St. Nick to find out who, what, what he can do to help people this year. Um, and that does lead to Elgin telling friends at school and at church that Santa Claus are just people that dressed up like St. Nick that work for him. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> but you know, uh, that's, that's hard. Um, we have some of the same sort of struggle with Cassidy, our daughter. You know, what do we tell her? And, and always trying to tell her, look, you know, each parent is going to tell her children something different, so you don't need to go out and, you know, tell kids, you know, about this. But we went ahead and told her, you know, the truth that St. Nicholas is a real, you know, was a real past Christian pastor, you know, who did many wonderful things and has now, you know, died, but that parents like to continue the tradition of St. Nicholas. And, give gifts to their children in kind of in the name of St. Nicholas, in the name of St. Claus. So that's the same, you know, so we sort of tell her, and this is the Santa Claus tradition is to live on, uh, with this, you know, with what Nicholas did. Um, and yeah, you know, it does rob a little bit of the, 
of the magic, I guess, of Christmas. And we just really didn't want to be in a position where, you know, we're saying Santa Claus is real and Jesus is also real. Uh, you know, but then one day saying, oh, yeah, by the way, Santa Claus is not real. But everything we told you about Bethlehem and the manger, uh, that is real. You mm-hmm. know, so, you, well, if you can't trust us on the one, how are we going to trust you on the other? You know, so you just felt like, eh, for the sake of integrity, you know, we need to go ahead and say, look, here, here's the way it is. And she's still happy to get Santa Claus gifts, um, even though she knows they're from us. You know, that's just fine. With her, she never refused a gift yet. The, the, I do like your idea of only giving three gifts. I may have to uh, invoke that this year. That's a good one. Well, the in uh, you know, I got it from my wife, but um, it was hers idea. <laughs> but the but I do think that there's a there's a uh, uh, that that conversation is a real difficult one, especially for people in churches where every family has different kind of rules. <laughs> And mm-hmm. and such, and if you are, if you are, you know, you're oh, you teach, you teach at the in the religion department at the school, Adam. What do you do? Or you know, you're a minister, and there's nothing quite like trying to figure out how you like. So if I say what I do, people mm-hmm. could take it real personal, like I'm judging what they mm-hmm. do just because you right. happen to you wrote a book on Saint Nick, or you're you're the one that you know taught the Advent workshop or whatever, right? Um, and 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 why I've why when people have asked a lot I've been excited to be able to tell them about the book is well now you can go meet Saint Nick you figure out what it looks like for you as a family to have um, traditions at Christmas where we do all the kind of stuff that normally happens but but you know has the aftertaste of Saint Nick not Coca Cola right uh, you know that's one thing that's really been exciting to talk to people who you know are asking okay how can I how can I do this you know how can I introduce Saint Nick you know, there's people are looking for new traditions and ways to enhance and enrich their family traditions uh, with St. Nicholas and to, in some ways, reclaim this real deep Christian, um, you know, spirit uh, of Christmas. And so, you know, I'm really encouraged by what I'm hearing. You know, people are tired of the, the thoroughly commercialized Christmas. Is there anything more that we can do? And, you know, again, that's where I think Nicholas is, can be of such value to us at this very moment because he, you know, he gives us something else to look at and something else to, you know, consider uh, in ways to you know, really, really bring new meaning to the holiday season. Uh, so that, that part's been really exciting. Well, All right, man. I'll talk to you later. Well, I definitely appreciate the conversation and you taking the time to do it. No problem. And I definitely wish you guys all the best, especially in the Christmas Advent season. And uh, you take care. All right. Tell everyone in Bowie's Creek High. Will do. Okay. Bye. Talk to you later. Yeah.